it is certainly the most joyful thing, the joy of love. The joy of love. And, and it's about the joy of love that this document uh, is speaking. So I have three previous methodologic, methodological remarks and I apologize if I'm a little bit tired, I admit, because the last days were very, very dense, but very joyful. And, uh, um, first of all, uh, I must uh, express my, my deep joy and gratitude for this document. Uh, I have read it, uh, and, and uh, I've read it with great and growing joy. Um, that means uh, it's worthy to be read uh, and uh, to be discussed after having been read. It would be quite useful to have read the document before discussing. Second previous remark. Um, Pope Francis told us at the beginning of the Synod, uh, I see one participant of the Synod among us, uh, of the first Synod, and we were together the same language group. Parlate con palesia e ascoltate con unita. He has repeated several times as an invitation. Speak with frankness, with paesia. And he said, I, I was sad when I heard from the cardinal that he didn't express what he had in his heart and mind because he thought it may offend the Holy Father. Now, uh, frankness, paesia, is a mark of Christian attitude. Um, uh, and, and therefore, it is important uh, among Christians, but especially in, a, in an academic institution, a Catholic academic institution, discussion is essential. Um, it should be based on arguments, uh, not only on emotions. Emotions are very important, we see in the document. But uh, it is so important. There is no forbidden question. There are sometimes stupid answers, uh, uh, but uh, normally there are no stupid questions. Uh, so this document is a magisterial document, but it is not an encyclical, it is an exhortation. It's another magisterial level. Uh, it's not an encyclical, it's not a more popular, it's not a canonical writing. It's, a, it's an exhortation, an apostolic exhortation. Uh, uh, it's an exhortation of uh, our Holy Father. And uh, that means that we have to, uh, to listen to it with uh, what uh, the dogmatic language calls religious uh, Cum affecto religioso, with uh, religious <coughs> readiness to, to, to submission, but not a refusal to discuss. And I think Pope Francis will be the last one to, to want us not to discuss what he proposes. Uh, and he is here well in, in the line of Pope Benedict who as a, as a professor, as a bishop, and then as, as the Holy Father, as the Pope, always insisted that we need this frank discussion because we are all in search of truth, on the way of truth, and therefore we need also to illuminate each other uh, with our uh, view and uh, our thoughts. 
And the third point is the third uh, uh, previous point is uh, I would suggest that you that we all read uh, this text uh, putting into brackets the note 351. Uh, it's the only place where the question of the sacraments is addressed for those in irregular situations. It's a very short note. But it tends to become the question of the synods and the questions of uh, this apostolic exhortation. Pope Francis said to me in an audience when we spoke about the coming synod between the two synods, he said to me, it's a eona trapola. It's a trap. It's a trap because we focus on one point and forget to see the whole picture. So, methodolo methodologically, I invite you to put this little footnote into brackets, it's only a footnote, and to see the document, to look and to listen to the document, to, so to say, the, the great vision, the, 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 the great arch uh, he is uh, building uh, in this apostolic exhortation. Um, I had the privilege yesterday to present uh, the document together with Cardinal Baldiseri and a couple. Uh, uh, and uh, there was an enormous interest. I had given at least 20 interviews after this public presentation. Great interest uh, throughout the world. But the interest very often is focused on note 351. Can they or can they not? Point, point, point. As if this were the only question. Yeah. Anyhow, it's, it's very difficult to overcome this narrowness, this tra trapola, this, this trap and to open our mind and our heart to this document. Um, I think as a Grand Chancellor of this institute, which uh, I love so much, which we all, I hope, we all love so much, uh, I think this has to be at least till the next apostolic exhortation on marriage and family in some years, this has to be part of the curriculum. It's evident. As familiaris consorzio <coughs> is part of the curriculum, as humane vitae is part of the curriculum, uh, because it's part of the ongoing teaching of the church uh, on marriage and family. And I think an institute that's mainly devoted to the study of marriage and family, of course, must be open and uh, interested uh, and seriously interested into uh, the magisterium of uh, the Holy Father. Now, I, I try to give you some of my impressions. Uh, of course, uh, it, uh, the text is long. Yeah, it's, it's an apostolic exhortation of Latin American dimensions. <laughs> we were used to Polish dimensions. In, uh, yeah, uh, Poland is large, and, yeah, but Latin America is large. <laughs> so, uh, but. Pope Francis, in the beginning, uh, there are some humorous aspects in, in, in his writing. Uh, he, he knows that the text is long. Perciò non consiglio, I haven't got the English text yet, uh, on my iPad, but uh, you were at the press conference yesterday. Yes. I'm, I'm happy to see uh, alumni of 
uh, ATI being at the press conference yesterday. Um, Hmm? That's what you needed. Uh, I can translate freely. <laughs> uh, I do not uh, uh, give you the advice to have a rapid reading. I, I rather recommend, says Pope Francis, uh, to read chapter by chapter. And I urge you to start with chapter 4. Uh, astonishingly, everybody rushes to chapter 8, where the question is the crisis of marriage and family. Uh, we, they have not heard the lecture of Professor Harshvetter. Uh, focus only on the problems. Oh, Francis, from the very beginning, invites us to focus on the good of marriage. It's the whole encyclical, the whole apostolic exhortation, is a, a great jubilus on the beauty and the richness of marriage and family. But of course, if you have a narrow focus only on one question, then you will miss the rest. Uh, so I urge you to read especially chapter 4, which is um, which is a great comment on chapter 13 of the first letter to the Corinthians. A detailed comment, uh, word by word, of this great thing uh, applied to the life of marriage and family. And it's so tasty, it's so, so rich, uh, so close to life, and so encouraging. After having heard your talk, where is uh, Michaela? Here she is. Uh, I, I must say it's, it's, it was a perfect introduction to uh, the document. Uh, as what you said about graduality is exactly uh, what is the, the great line of step by step leading into the deepness, into the depth into the full reality of marriage and family, of the sacramental uh, life. Uh, and what you said about motivation. Uh, Pope Francis tries to show that we should not uh, be discouraged by the failures, the many difficulties, to be motivated uh, for uh, the sacrament of marriage. And motivation needs attraction from the good. Uh, as I will, will show, I think, uh, I think the, the whole document has a very Thomistic, Thomistic Grundlinie, uh, red thread. Because the, the, the key of the document is uh, that we can only be motivated for trusting love, marital love, and marriage, and family, if we are motivated, if we believe, uh, if we deeply believe that it is possible and that it is uh, good. Um, but nevertheless, uh, I, I want to start with, a, after this introduction, start with a point which may not uh, receive the full agreement of all of you, and uh, I'm not afraid about that, because we can discuss it. Um, it's not a secret I come from a so-called broken family, a patchwork family. Uh, um, we have received now a seminarian in the diocese, a very nice young, young man, good, 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 talented young man. He's a typical situation of many families today. Uh, 
my children, your children, our child. He is our child from two broken marriages. So he has half brothers of this side, half brothers of this side, and he's uh, the one of a new marriage. Uh, can you? Sorry to say that, but but I think it is it is important to also to understand. The, the, the notes of this document, the, the sound of this document, or the taste. Can you understand that the, the church talk on marriage and family is sometimes uh, difficult to listen to for people who have not had the chance uh, to grow up in a solid family. And this is the case of a great, great number of young people. How does the church address them, encouraging them that marriage and love is possible? What language do we have on marriage and family? Uh, and I think this is, this is a, a one of the deep motivations of Pope Francis is to, to help people who are in irregular situations or coming from irregular situations to be attracted by, let us say, the idea of Catholic sacramental marriage. Um, Pope Francis overcomes somehow, uh, and, and I, I think this is important, overcomes uh, somehow a dichotomy between the regular and the irregular situations. Uh, because uh, if you come from an irregular situation, you may have the impression there are the regulars and here are the irregulars. But the gospel is different. St. Paul says that, you know the, uh, the word in uh, Romans, in Romans 11, 32, God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. The, 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 the deep line of this document is what uh, Michaela said in her talk from, from Professor Ratzinger. We are all in via. We are all in via. To holiness. All. Whether our marriage is uh, uh, real, uh, realized and uh, happy and so to say, in order, or whether it is not in order. Uh, we are all on the way, on the journey, in a marriage in which everything is going well, is journey. It must grow, it must learn, it must grow even into old age. There's a beautiful passage well, Pope Francis speaks about the renewal of marital love in old age. How to learn the new dimensions of all the aspects of marital love uh, in elder years. We are all on the way. And therefore, <coughs> Therefore, the language of this document is uh, inclusive, not in the, uh, in the sense of um, gender inclusiveness. It is inclusive, as he explicitly said, the gospel addresses everybody. And it's an invitation to everybody. It's an invitation. And the Christian discourse on the family 
the Christian vision of marriage and the family has to become an invitation, an encouragement to the joy of love in which we can believe and in which, from which no one, nobody is excluded, really nobody. So what I, I would call uh, the kind of language event of, um, of Pope Francis Ja, uh, already Evangelii Gaudium and now uh, Amoris Laetitia is a language of deep respect and appreciation. <coughs> um, I know uh, some are afraid when you say how can you address uh, irregular situations with a language of deep respect and uh, even appreciation. Um, um, I know this this language of inclusion, uh, inclusion in the sense of addressing everybody and inviting everybody, troubles some people. Uh, it's the fear of relativism. I know from the synod discussions, the two synod meetings, uh, the fear of relativism. Does it uh, lead to relativism when uh, you address uh, people in irregular situation with a language of respect? But I think that the, uh, what already Pope uh, Francis said in Evangelii Gaudium, it is not, uh, first of all, to judge the situation, to, start, to put everybody in a category. First, we meet people, we meet person. Uh, and for everybody, it applies what he said in Evangelii Gaudium. Uh, we must take off our shoes before the sacred ground of the other. The image of Moses taking off his shoes for the sacred ground of God's presence. God's presence in every person. <coughs> Take off the shoes before the sacred ground of the other. And this fundamental attitude runs throughout the whole exaltation and it provides the most profound reason for the two other key words of the document, discernment and to accompany. And these words apply not only to the so-called irregular situations, but rather for all people, for every marriage. Discernment uh, is a biblical term that's especially an Ignatian term. Pope Francis is really a Jesuit. I can say this as a Dominican. Uh, with deep respect, he is truly, uh, is truly a Jesuit. But the, in, the, in the spiritual exercise of St. Ignatius, the key question is to discern what is God's will in this my situation. And this openness we, we can observe in Pope Francis' own daily life. This openness, this disponibility sent me, uh, I am ready. Uh, disponibility for the discern, for, 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 for God's will now in my life, God's presence in my life. And, um, we will see uh, in chapter 8, famous chapter 8, how important this keyword discernment uh, becomes for the difficult situations of marriages. It does not mean uh, 
Permissiveness does not mean relativism. It means, first of all, conversion. Another word that Michaela has used, uh, centered in, in her intervention, conversion. And, of course, uh, Pope Francis refers, uh, how can he do otherwise, to uh, John chapter 8, the adultery woman. He does not uh, relativize adultery. There's no trace of relativism. Jesus only points to all of us. Who of you is without sin, he may throw the first stone. It's not said that adultery is not adultery. It is only said that we all need conversion. Uh, let me quote a, a, a longer passage to give more his original sound. It's uh, number 36 of Amoris Laetitia. Uh, 35. As Christians, against relativism, as Christians, we can hardly stop advocating marriage simply to avoid countering contemporary sensibilities uh, or out of desire to be fashionable or a sense of helplessness in the face of human and moral failings. We cannot renounce to present the fullness of uh, uh, Christian sacramental marriage. We would, be try be, we would be depriving the world of values that we can and must offer. It is true that there is no sense in simply decrying present day's evils as if this could change things. Nor is it helpful to try to impose rules by sheer authority not by she or by motivation. What we need is a more responsible and generous effort to present the reasons and motivations for choosing marriage and the family, and in this way to help man and woman better to respond to the grace that God offers them. I think it's exactly what Michaela said about, about uh, the right understanding of graduality. I hope so. But then he, he, he adds, uh, the Christian vision of marriage and family has an unchanged force of attraction. He deeply believes that we must not be fear to present, uh, must not fear to present marriage and family in the Christian vision. But, he adds, we also need to, hum, to be humble and realistic and acknowledging that at times the way we present our Christian beliefs and treat other peoples has helped contribute to today's problematic situation. This self-critique is certainly healthy. We have also proposed a far too abstract and almost artificial theological ideal of marriage, far removed from the concrete situations and practical possibilities of families così come sono, as they are. This excessive idealization, especially when we have failed to inspire trust in God's grace, has not helped to make marriage more desirable and attractive, but quite the opposite. I think uh, one background uh, we never must forget reading the Apostolic Exhortation is that Pope Francis has had to do a lot with poor families. <coughs> 